Well, happy Dad's Day, everyone. That, that you know, deserves that title. Really? That's it? Wow. Okay. Oh, thank you. That's what I see. I'm feeling a little insecure right there. Yeah. Hey, you know, for, for me, the, uh, the best title that I could possibly have is to be uh, known as a follower of Jesus, as unlikely as that would, would be, if you know who I am, and a son of a God who loves me. My second would be that I am a husband to the most fantastic woman who's ever lived in human history. Oh, wasn't that, wasn't that sweet? No, I, I really... I really do mean that. I do. And then to be a, a dad and a granddad, it's, uh, it's a really big deal. It's a big deal to be a dad. I discovered that again this last week as I sat with two dads. One at Phoenix Children's Hospital, who is there with his uh, seven, eight-year-old son, who this last week they discovered he had a softball-sized tumor in his liver. And a dad who wants to lead his family to faithfully trust Jesus. But you see, it really counts in moments like that. It's not theory, right? It really counts. And just to watch him just want to be that, that dad who leads, leads well, faithfully, and strong. Uh, it was wonderful to see. And then on Friday, I met with another dad whose uh, 13-year-old son took his own life on Wednesday evening. And how does a dad be a dad in that situation, right? But to hear him pour his heart out and how he wants to he wants to be a faith-filled dad and wants to lead his family at a time like this. And uh, boy, you know, being a dad, it's a big deal, isn't it? It really is. Not just in those occasions, but all the time. Men, our lives make a difference in our families. They imprint our children. They imprint our grandchildren. They imprint our spouses as our spouses imprint us. I don't, there's just such a high calling, such a privilege to be a dad who uh, has a responsibility of forming kids, Right? I mean, isn't that a big deal? It really is. And so, uh, part of what I want to do this morning is look at, at David, and uh, we've been thinking about his life from the context of what it means to be what God thinks of David when God sees David. And we've been pulling out this particular passage of Scripture. It says, David, a man about whom God said, I found David, son of Jesse, a man after my own heart. And uh, what we've concluded with that, that's a bit simplistic, there's more to it, but we've been saying somebody who's a person after God's own heart is somebody who orients their life toward God. And all that they think about for the future, it's God-centered, God-focused. I go to God for decisions, I go, for him, go to Him for direction, I listen for Him, and I'm oriented toward Him, or I'm organized around Him. And in my present moment, God, what would you do now? How would you lead? What would you have me do here in this moment at this time? See, it's, it's real stuff. It's not theoretical, right? And we've been learning from examples from David's life where that really takes hold for him. And the, the truth is, as we've seen in some of his examples, he doesn't do it perfectly. It doesn't lead to like the, the perfect, wonderful model life. It doesn't. I mean, here's a guy who lies to protect his own skin. Yeah, he's a guy that... Uh, has this adulterous affair with a married woman. And if that isn't bad enough, he takes out the guy who she's married to. And there's just other things like that. It's also safe to say that nobody confesses his sin publicly like David does too. But it's this mess of life that David shows us. And he shows us the wonder of those pristine, wonderful times where against all odds, he leans in with God. And it's just this, like this deal and so we've been looking at real examples, trying to put ourselves in those and saying, if I was to be a person after God's own heart, oriented toward him and organized around him, what would I do in those circumstances, in those situations? And so week by week, we've been looking at different uh, incidents from David's life and trying to apply that to ourselves. So this, what I want to do this morning is I don't want to look at a specific incident. I want to look at a unique friendship that David and Jonathan share together. Uh, and my purpose with it is to, not specifically guys, but guys for us, maybe more so than for our female partners and, and uh, confidants, is building the kind of friendship that J David and Jonathan share may be harder for us and more challenging for us than it, it is for our female partners and friends. And I want to look at 
how these guys do it. All in the backdrop of a couple of guys whose hearts are after the heart of God. Both of them are. It's not exclusive for David, just like it's not exclusive for him as it relates to us. We can all have a heart after him. But to look at how that friendship develops and a couple of qualities, there are many, but I want to look at two qualities of that friendship that I think are so attractive. We're kind of compelled to them ourselves and we want to be that kind of friend. So maybe we can learn a little bit from Jonathan and David. And uh, so what I want to do is give you the whole arc of the story. First of all, it's over five chapters. So we'll be reading five chapters of 1 Samuel together. No, we won't. Uh, you might actually, you know, if you want to open up your, your uh, electronic device or your Bible, you can do that. They'll come up on the screen, but really they're from five different chapters. We'll kind of cover the arc. So first of all, how did the friendship develop? Well, we first encounter them immediately following David's great victory over Goliath. He's this new war hero and uh, he's brought into Saul so that he can get appropriately honored and recognized for what he's done. And so we'll pick it up there, 1 Samuel 18. It says, after David had finished talking with Saul, like that's that occasion, he met Jonathan for the first time, the king's son. There was an immediate bond between them for Jonathan loved David. Now, I think there was chemistry Love tends to grow over time. I'm not sure all this happened at the same time. Possibly it did. It would be love at first sight, so that can happen. But I think, like, chemistry happened, and then love grew. Uh, verse 2 says, From that day on, Saul kept David with him and wouldn't let him return home. Gives him a promotion. And Jonathan made a solemn pact with David because he loved him as he loved himself. The relationship starts to get interesting here. This is what Jonathan does. He sealed the pact by taking off his robe and giving it to David together with his tunic, sword, bow, and belt. I'm not going to go back over that again. You can go back a couple of weeks. We talked about that a little bit. But just to say this, this was a highly unusual friendship. You wouldn't naturally say those two guys are going to connect together for a couple of reasons. One is Jonathan's about 25 years older than David. David's probably about 15, as best historians can tell us. Jonathan's about 40. That's not a natural connection. But here's even a bigger deal than that. They're both in line for the same throne. Jonathan is the crown prince. David is anointed by God. There's a collision coming. You would think they might be competitive in our competitive world. They would be. But lo and behold, we see what Jonathan does. He has affection for David, and he abdicates the throne, so to speak, to David and defers to him. That's a remarkable thing to do. If you're a relationship principle person and you want to write down something, this isn't actually where I want to go with it, but maybe a principle of somebody who has an orientation toward God and organized around God and is that kind of friend is actually more interested in their friend's success than their own and they get greater joy when their friend succeeds than when they do. Now that's a bit odd, isn't it? But this evidently is what happens in this relationship. It's really quite something. So, uh, David has this great victory, Saul, or Jonathan and, and David become close friends, and then there's a third partner in this whole thing. He's kind of the antagonist of the whole deal, and that's Saul himself, King Saul. He sees David's success and popularity, gets crazy jealous and crazy envious over it, and he actually goes to the place where he says, I want to kill David, like bizarre as that is. That's what he wants to do. And so, he actually takes a shot at it at, at one point. And Jonathan must have become aware of that happening, and he couldn't believe that his dad actually had it in his heart to kill David. He's not sure of it. He's a little offended that his dad would do it. So he decides, Dad, you and I need to have a conversation. Let's meet tomorrow morning over breakfast, but we got to talk about this because I can't quite understand what you're doing. And so if we jump to the next chapter, 1 Samuel 19, we read this. The next morning, Jonathan spoke with his father about David, saying many good things about him. He's defending his friend. The king must not sin against his servant David, Jonathan said. He's never done anything to harm you. He's always helped you in any way that he could. Have you forgotten about the time that he risked his life to kill the Philistine giant and how the Lord brought a great victory for all Israel as a result? Your kingdom. You were certainly happy about it then, Dad. Why should you murder an innocent man like David? There's no reason for it at all. So Saul obviously thought about it. He says that he's listened to Jonathan and he vowed, as surely as the Lord lives, David will not be killed. Afterward, Jonathan called David and told him what had happened. Then he brought David to Saul and David served in the court as before. Way to go, Jonathan. 
Like it worked. You intervened and defended your friend at some risk to yourself. Your dad listened. He relented. And Jonathan and your dad are reconciled. He's brought back to the, back to the, the castle. And we're going to be good. No, we're not. Evidently, Saul has short-term memory problems. And it doesn't take very long before he sees David as a threat once again and goes after him to kill him. And David goes all Jason Bourne, right? And gets out of town, sneaks out, and gets to safety someplace. But now he's a fugitive, and that bothers Jonathan. So Jonathan goes to try to find out where he is, and he searches for him. David and Jonathan have this amazing conversation where Jonathan's not quite sure. I think it was a dilemma for him. How do I remain loyal and faithful to the friend I love and still honor my dad? How do I do that? David, are you absolutely sure it's in my dad's heart to do this? I can't believe my dad would do that. So why don't we test it out? Why don't we test my dad's motives? And they arrange this deal where Jonathan's going to go to his dad and uh, there's an event that David should be at, and David's not going to be there, and we're gonna, they're going to see what Saul, how Saul responds to it. And he royally messes the thing up. He responds very badly, and Jonathan becomes convinced that this is danger. So covertly, he gets a message to David using bows and arrows, and you can read about that in 1 Samuel 20. We're going to pick it up there. It says, Then Jonathan gave the bow and arrows that he used to communicate to David to the boy, and told him to take them back to town. As soon as the boy was gone, David came out from where he had been hiding near the stone pile. Then David bowed three times to Jonathan with his face to the ground. The one who had been given the king's crown now bows to the one who gave him the crown. It's really something. Both of them were in tears and they embraced each other and said goodbye, especially David. At last, Jonathan said to David, go in peace, for we have, been, we have sworn loyalty to each other in the Lord's name. The Lord is a witness of a bond between us, you and me, David, our children forever from generation to generation. Then David left, and Jonathan returned to town. It's interesting how a couple of guys who are known for their military prowess, and they're warriors, these are warrior guys, how they end up hugging it out and crying on each other's shoulder at the thought of not being together. That happens all the time. No, it doesn't. These guys don't do that very much. Maybe occasionally, but not much. You see, they likely would not see each other for some time now, and they were aware of it. Saul continues his personal mission to find and kill David. And along the way, it's like Jonathan is sitting in the war room as Saul and his guys are strategizing how they're going to get David. Jonathan hears something about Saul going to Ziph to find David because that's where David is. Jonathan preempts that and gets to David first of all, and that's where we pick it up several chapters later in 1 Samuel 23. It says, one day near Horish, David received news that Saul was on his way to Ziph, that's that area, to search for him and kill him. Jonathan went to find David ahead of Saul and his elite troops and encouraged him to stay strong in his faith in God. He doesn't sympathize with David. He doesn't just say, David, you're going to make it out by your strength and power. He doesn't slam his dad in front of David. He simply says, David, I want to direct your attention to the one whose heart you're inclined toward, you're oriented and organized around. Keep trusting God, David. I know this looks rough. I know my dad's coming. What a friend is that to do that, to turn his attention to God, the one who gives strength to him. Don't be afraid, Jonathan assured him. My father will never find you. You're going to be the king of Israel, and I will be next to you, as my father Saul is well aware. So the two of them renewed their solemn pact before the Lord, and I can see them hugging and kissing again. Then Jonathan returned home while David stayed at Horish, and these two would never see each other again. Shortly after this, Saul will lead a military campaign with John, Jonathan with him, a misguided attempt to secure some territory, and both Saul and Jonathan will die on the battlefield. David will be anointed the king, and uh, if we were to jump ahead to 2 Samuel, it opens up with Jonathan and David's funeral. And uh, David has written a song for the occasion. And it's quite remarkable. Some of the lyrics of the song are this, How I weep for you, my brother Jonathan. 
Oh, how much I loved you. And this is the friendship. It's a wonderful friendship. So what can we learn from it? What might be some learnings we could gather from it? Well, first of all, I would say we could learn just the raw necessity for us as human beings to have friends, real friends. Not pretend friends, but real friends like Jonathan and David. Do you think that God would intend that for us? Do you think that would be something he would want for us to experience? I think so. It would not be over, an overstatement to say that Jonathan and David's friendship saves Jonathan's life or saves David's life. Because those two are together, Jonathan intervenes a number of times, defends David on other occasions, warns him on other occasions, but it it's, would be realistic to say that God saved David's life because he had Jonathan in his life. What kind of a faithful, loyal friendship is that? Follow this logic with me, if you would. You and I are not meant to, nor are we wired to, get through adversity alone or without friendship. You and I are going to go through life with some adversity along the way. Therefore, you actually can't get through life without friends. You can't. It's not intended to be that way. Some of us would say, well, yeah, so I find it hard to make friends, but I've got a, I've got a spouse. It is she or he are they a friend spouse? You see that sometimes we're not married to our friend. We're married to our spouse and there's a difference in the friend. Some of you say, well, I got brothers and sisters and siblings. Yeah, but are they Jonathan friend kind of brothers and sisters and siblings? David and Jonathan have this true type of friendship and it's important to think about it logically, but it's important to think about it theologically as well. There's a truth revealed in this, the character of God in this. Way back at the very beginning of human history in Genesis, we read about it, where God makes this beautiful garden, Garden of Eden. It's paradise. It's perfect. Everything is as he wants it. He has free reign to make what he's going to make, and he makes this fantastic place. And then he creates Adam, and he puts it in, and he says, this is good, except for one thing. There's nobody to spend Dave, or Adam's time with. He's got no companion. He's got no friend. And so God creates Eve. And I, I know the typical thing is to think of that as marriage. And that's not wrong to think of it. But you know what the bottom line is? It's companionship. God makes this perfect place and he says it's only missing one thing. And that is that Adam doesn't do this alone. I'm going to create a companion for him. A friend to do life with. It's important to God to do that. When Jesus enters this world... He does not come into this world to teach correct doctrine. He doesn't come into this world to change some bad behaviors or to give a new moral direction or a set of laws for people to follow. He doesn't do it to set out a religious organization or a movement. You know what he, why he comes into this world? To reestablish a broken companionship, a broken relationship that has happened. That matters so much to God. He transcends the whole universe to come into this world so you and I can have the companionship with God that we're designed to have. It matters to God across the board. You see it in the Trinity, how the Trinity relates to one another. This is very close to the heart of God that we would have companionship here on earth. Similar to what Jonathan and David experienced. It's quite remarkable. I would say this. You cannot be truly human, fully human, if you don't have that kind of friendship in your life. You're missing something. You are. Now, that may be overstatement, but I want to give you a rather cheesy, although entertaining example of this from a 1935 movie called The Bride of Frankenstein. <laughs> There's theology in The Bride of Frankenstein. You bet there is. You've got to look for it a little bit, but it's there. If you're not familiar with it, uh, this scientist right over here, his name is Henry Frankenstein, and he longs to create life. He's not sure exactly how to do it, so he goes about it this way. He collects body parts from dead people sews them together and makes that guy right there. And at a timely point, a stroke of lightning hits the monster that he's created and it comes to life. But as much as it's alive, it is not human. It doesn't have the emotion. It doesn't have the conscience. It doesn't have those kind of qualities of a human that apparently you can't get from a strike of lightning. So he breaks free from Dr. Frankenstein and uh, does some damage and hurts and kills some people and runs off into the woods and the citizens chase after this monster. And he happens to come across a cabin 
where a hermit who can't see lives. And he stumbles into the door and, well, here's the encounter with the monster and the hermit. Who is it? You're welcome, my friend, whoever you are. Uh, 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 uh. Who are you? I think you're a stranger to me. I cannot see you. I cannot see anything. You must please excuse me, but I'm blind. Uh, come in, my poor friend. No one will hurt you here. Uh, what's the matter? Uh, You're hurt, my poor friend. Come. Sit down. Now tell me, who are you? I don't understand. Can you not speak? Uh, uh. It's strange. Perhaps, perhaps you're afflicted too. I cannot see and you cannot speak. Is that it? <laughs> you stay here. I'll get you some food. Uh. We shall be friends. I have prayed many times for God to send me a friend. <sighs> it's very lonely here, and it's been a long time since any human being came into this hut. I shall look after you, and you will comfort me. Now you must lie down and go to sleep. Yes, yes. Now you must sleep. Our Father, I thank thee that in thy great mercy Thou hast taken pity on my great loneliness, and now, out of the silence of the night, hast brought two of thy lonely children together and sent me a friend to be a light to mine eyes and a comfort in time of trouble. Amen. moves from being just alive to being more human by being with someone who's human. The next scene is going to be the monster being discovered in the cabin and he's under threat so he runs out of the cabin, runs into the woods and the citizens chase him in you know, fear-fueled anger and they've got guns and they're going to shoot him and he runs off into the woods and you hear him say this as he's pondering, looking around for some help. He goes, friend, friend, friend. That time in the cabin so impacted him that he was formed and shaped to be more human. Okay, it's a fake, it's a pretend, it's a fictional story. It doesn't actually happen. Oh, but it does. We are made more human. We are made more transformed by being with people and having friends like Jonathan and David experience. What's the point of it? There's nothing more humanizing and transforming than what happens in a friendship, especially one that's oriented toward God and organized around him. Two people, if that's their focus and that's their thought, it is remarkable what God can do in the hearts of people 
who look to each other and to him that way. So what are the qualities? Well, here's a couple. There are more. But there's a couple of qualities we see in David and Jonathan. I'll go through these quickly. I would say two of them are this. One is transparency and the other is loyalty. Tim Keller says this about uh, Jonathan and David's friendship. He says that they are the kind of friends that let each other in, transparency, and don't let each other down. That's loyalty. Transparency, we see this early in David and Jonathan's world and life. It says in verse 1 of chapter 18 of 1 Samuel, it says they had an immediate bond between them. It's not exactly the right wording. If you go to the original wording, it's more like, it'd be more accurate to say their souls were knit together. Now that's different than just agreeing on something. That's different than sharing the same emotional equation. That's different than, it's, it's actually, to, to try to define it is they opened their lives completely to each other. No pretense, no pretending, no presumption, no pushing, no prodding. Just open, this is me. Open life, open door, open book, open window. This is me. And that's what it means. Their hearts were knit together. Their souls were knit together with each other. Two of the hardest areas for us to open up about are our weaknesses and our emotions. They are. Do you remember the point in the story that we read where Both these guys, David and Jonathan, realize that Saul's not going to end his pursuit of David, that David is done for, for all intents and purposes. And uh, they have that moment together where it says in 1 Samuel 20, it says, both of them were in tears as they embraced each other. Actually, what it says is they were not only embraced, but they kissed. That's right. And they embraced. This was no ordinary embrace. This was like a full frontal embrace, two dudes crying on each other's shoulders. When's the last time you did that? When's the last time you saw that and didn't go someplace in your imagination as to what that relationship was all about? Right? If you want to know how to do man hugs, turn to, you can flip onto YouTube, variety of fantastic videos that'll help you with that, guys. But here's what we need to understand what's going on in this, okay? The context, the historical context of this. In ancient times, men were actual warriors. Warriors armor, weapons, that's what they were. Every day they would actually defend their tribe. They would protect their livestock. They would shield their families. They would put their lives on the line every day. That's what they would do. They killed wild animals to feed their families, sometimes with their bare hands. In other words, these men knew that they were tough. They were. And therefore, they could weep and they could kiss without anyone suggesting that they were compromising their manhood. Guys, there's so much pressure on us to be men, men's men. And sometimes we pretend we're tougher than we are. We fake it because that's the acceptable thing. That's the cultural norm. Don't be soft. Don't be weak. Be tough. Suck it up. Be a man, right? So much pressure for us. And then when we do that, here's what happens. We start to withhold or hide our spectrum of tender emotions because we think our manhood is in danger. Oh, and not just with other men, but guys, when we withhold those tender spectrum of emotions, we often do it with our children and with our spouse. And what they long for is that tender expression from us as men. I think of tough guy Paul, Acts 20. Like this is Paul, like lost at sea Paul out on an open ocean, beaten with rods, 40 lashes minus one several times, left for dead, put in jail. Tough guy, Paul, saw it all. He gets together with some elders of a church that he started, invites them down to a beach, and what do they do? They kneel down, they pray, and then they get up and hug and they weep together. Because that was what the emotion was, and they weren't gonna hide it. There's a kind of friendship that David and Jonathan have where they're open about their emotions. Can we do that? Can we take the risk to do that? Quickly, here's the second piece, loyalty. What's the first thing we see David and Jonathan do after they meet? Shortly after it anyways, there's this covenant that they have. They actually make a covenant together, a covenant of loyalty, of faithfulness, of fidelity together. They actually express it and then they show it. 
There's a transfer of arms. There's a transfer of the prince's robe. David bows. There is this covenant that happens. Theirs is a covenantal relationship. That's different than another kind of relationship. It's a covenant relationship. They've made some promises to each other. So what does it mean to have this kind of a friend? What's a covenantal friendship? Well, let me try to explain it this way. The Home Depot and I have a friendship. Uh, whenever I need some building supplies or tools, I go to Home Depot. That's what I do. I'm drawn to Home Depot. It's like a bromance with Home Depot. Not with Lowe's. It's too girl for me. Like, sorry if you work there, but it's too, pri too precise, too neat, too organized. I like the chaos of Home Depot with stuff lying on the floor and stuff gone through, and it's just a mess. It's a wonderful place. Really, I just, I just go there to be there with my Home Depot friend, right? So we have this friendship. And whenever I need a piece of hardware or lumber or paint or wood glue, I go to them. I am a loyal Home Depot friend. They can count on me. And I've been able to count on them. However, we both know that I am under no obligation to stick with them. I'm not. I can at any point stop shopping there. I can go buy my wood glue at true value or Lowe's. If someone else's prices or quality are better than they are, I can choose to buy it from them instead. I don't, do not need to let Home Depot know what I'm doing. I do not need to, the next time I'm in Home Depot, go to the customer service area and confess that I have shopped someplace else. I don't actually have to do that. I don't. I don't need to keep going back no matter how high their prices are or how bad the quality gets. And I'm likely never ever to stand in front of a judge who will help us figure out how to disentangle this relationship. <laughs> I can just leave. Why? Because it's not a covenantal relationship. It's a user relationship. I use them, and they use me. And it works fine, as long as we get equal value. If I ever take something from their store and don't pay them, there's a cost-benefit calculator that comes in here, and there's going to be some pain, right? I could flat out ignore Home Depot and just go someplace else. They're going to lose my vast sums of wealth that I won't choose, <laughs> right? But it's all cost-benefit, and there's that little calculator going on. Jonathan and David do not do that. In fact, it appears it's the other way. They get great benefit from giving their stuff away to the other person. It's ridiculous. But that's the nature of a covenant relationship versus a user relationship. It's the kind of friendship that David and Jonathan experience that is attractive, and it's compelling, and it's actually inspiring. Loyal friends are sticky friends, particularly Jonathan. In the end, David will be saved because Jonathan will not be disloyal to David, nor will he turn against his dad or turn David into his dad. And as a result, if you read the rest of the story, Jonathan not only has given up his throne to David, but it would be safe to say Jonathan gives up his life for David. Does that sound familiar? Does that sound like somebody else that you know? In Jesus' final dialogue with his friends, he says this, guys, uh, I know you might have thought of me as your master and you're the servants, but as of today, not anymore. Today we're friends. He says that in John 15. And he goes on from there to say, there's no greater love that people show for each other than that they lay down their lives for their friends. And who did that? the one who has a covenantal relationship with us, the one who's loyal, the one who's transparent, the one who is amazing as a friend. So I would suggest this. The source of the kind of friendship that David and Jonathan experienced was found because they were two men oriented toward God and organized around him. Did they have some natural chemistry? You bet. But there's something about seeing the friendship with God, or in our case, we get to see the friendship that Jesus has for us and go, that's crazy. That's so amazing that I would be the friend of the creator of the universe, the savior of the world. He treats me like a friend. How does he treat me? He's infinitely loyal. He's so transparent in who he is. He lives his life out in the open. I want to be like him. Now, truth is, if you become like that, you're going to have more friends because you'll be so desirable to have as a friend. But that's not the point. The point is the source of how we become that kind of friend. We get that way by developing and understanding the depth of Jesus' friendship with us. 
Jesus is the ultimate friend. He'll let you in and never let you down. He's transparent. He's vulnerable. He's the ultimate warrior, right? He's the warrior king who comes into this world and defeats the greatest enemy that anybody has ever faced, Satan, death, and sin, and he wins. He's a victorious warrior king, and yet he weeps with sadness. He perspires when stress is big in his life. He cries at funerals. He gently forgives and remains quiet when he's treated unjustly because he's vulnerable, and some would even say he's weak. He's weak, but it's a choice he makes to be vulnerable, to become mortal, to come into this world, to spread his arms on a cross, and if that isn't a vulnerable enough position, he lets his hands be nailed in that position. This is the vulnerable nature of our King, Savior, Warrior, Jesus Christ, who understands the power of that transparency. He's also loyal. When he's in the garden, within minutes of his arrest that's going to lead to his death, he asks his friends, would you hang out with me for a while and could we pray together? And they what? They fall asleep. And still he dies for them. They betray him. And still he dies for them. They deny who he is. And still he dies for them. They doubt. They question. And still he dies for them. What loyalty is that? What loyalty? He's a loyal friend and he knows the difference between being a user and being a covenantal kind of friend. We have to invest in this friendship with Jesus. We must. If we want to become the friend that we see David and Jonathan experience, if we want to become that, not just have that, but become that, we find that as we invest deeply in our relationship with Jesus Christ and when we invest in knowing him, in understanding, in reading about him, discovering him, walking with him, living with him, engaging him in every experience of our lives. What happens? We are actually transformed and we become more the person we are going to be. That silly video from the monster, okay? He spends a little bit of time with a blind hermit. But it's, a, it's the beginning of a transformation for someone who's not even human. I know it's just a story. But the principle behind it is you hang out with Jesus with intentionality. You enjoy his friendship that he so wants to share with you. You experience it in all kinds of settings, difficult settings, joyful settings, in every way. But you invest in that friendship. You will become more like him because you'll think more like him. And you will become a friend. Like Jesus is a friend to us. It's marvelous the way this works. It's amazing how it works. And I would just challenge you, guys in particular, if you don't have a friend like Jonathan and David experience, don't go looking for a friend here on earth. Look for a friend in Jesus and stand back and watch and see what kind of a friend you become and how many friends you actually have. Jesus, it's for your sake and it's because of your model. It's because of what you've shown us. It's because of the kind of friend that you are that we're inspired to think about the friendships that we could have. I pray for my fellow brothers here. For some reason, it can be such a challenge for us at times to find this kind of friendship and we have a lot of superficial relationships at times and guys that are buddies and guys that we can hang with. But maybe we don't have many that do what Jonathan did where he points, he points us to you, King Jesus, or defends us, or is transparent and is loyal like you are. Form us into people who think like you, Jesus, so that in our world we can be friends like that in our world to people around us, that we can model who you are because we've experienced who you are. I pray that you would do that in all of the guys in the church, but across the board, it's not just a guy thing. But Jesus, if you'll you'll do that and form us into your likeness, we really think that it, it could make a difference where we live and the people we live with, the people we work with and we're around. And we'll be so grateful, Jesus, if you'll do that. Thanks for being that kind of a friend to us.